librarian here at Westboro, and we're so happy that you're here. And we're very excited. I'm, I'm kind of sad that Tracy is our adult services librarian, and she does a much better introduction. But we're very excited to have Bob Ainsworth here. He was. Um, He's going to do an amazing story about the heist. And I'm going to let you introduce yourself so I don't screw it up. <laughs> but we are very excited that you're here, even more excited that Bob's here. And just enjoy the fish. Okay. Uh, so there's a notebook going around, and that has um, uh, police reports from the day of the theft. And they call it the Elizabeth Stewart Gardner Museum. Elizabeth. <laughs> the cops weren't exactly sure where they were. Um, so my name is Bob Ainsworth. I live in Marlboro. Um, my wife is getting a power cord because I hope this doesn't die before I'm done, but I'll talk really fast if I have to. Um, if you can't hear me back there, let me know. I'll yell a little more. Um, so I was an accountant, uh, went to BC, and uh, used to, when I read as a kid, I was a history and mystery guy. So uh, as a teenager, I read all the Perry Masons, so General Stanley Gardner, and those are being re you know run now with uh, Raymond Burr in it. I love those things. Although I got in trouble with the librarian because I was like 12, and she was like, oh my god, he's reading this adult stuff. It's like, Perry Mason, it's not like there's sex or anything in it, it's just pretty vanilla. But my dad said let him read it, so I did. Um, but I always loved that stuff, and so I got to my retirement, and I was thinking of what I was going to do, and I was going to teach, but they wanted me to teach in the summer, and that was like no good. Yeah. And, um, and I thought I could do consulting, but you know, I'm not, uh, I don't have a lot of contacts, I was in accounting, I was in sales, so that really didn't do it. And I started thinking about, you know, maybe I could come up with an idea that I could write about. And so I started thinking about it, and I actually thought about the show Ironside. Remember that one, where he, where he was in the wheelchair, and he had his crew, and he solved stuff. And I was thinking, well, so who do I know? How can I do that? And um, I hit on an idea that people I admired in my work life would be the good guys. And the people I thought were would be my bad guys. <laughs> so I had faces. Oh. Right? And people and mannerisms and everything to populate everything. So that was sort of a, well, part A. And part B was I was going to write about where I've been and what I know. So duped, I've been to the museum a bunch of times. Uh, the book Con is set on Nantucket at a friend of ours house. They've got this gigantic 10,000 square foot house. But that's set on Nantucket and all the places I've visited. And the third one, Scammed, is set on the North Shore where my wife comes from. So I sort of solved two of the issues of who are the people and where am I going to write. Um, and then I just had to come up with some crimes, and so I had my last job, I was commuting into Boston, and I started writing in a notebook, and I filled it in about a month. And I typed it up, and I had a, like 150 double-spaced pages, which is almost half a book. And it wasn't great, you know, when looking back on it, it was actually pretty bad, but I could do it, I could fill it, I could get a, a thing going, and I could write dialogue and all that. So that's what I've done. And so I've written three books, and one, my fourth book is going to be about Charles Ponzi, set in 1920s Boston. Oh, yeah. The next book like, is going to be about sports and stuff, but it's a lot of fun. And so I wrote this book, Duke, because uh, I had a character in Khan, which I wrote first, and uh, a friend of mine said, oh, I love your Uncle Louis character. Give him a story. So I tried to think of the biggest crime I could, and I started thinking about the Da Vinci Code, right, with Catholic Church and Mary Light and Magdalene and all that. It's just like, what's the biggest one in Boston? Mm -hmm. Isabella. So I put him in that and wrote the book, and that's what it is. And then that same guy booked me in the Gardner, Massachusetts, not the Isabella Gardner, <laughs> the Gardner, Mass. He booked me in a museum up there and said, you're doing a presentation in six weeks. You better get your ass in here. So I wrote it, I did a PowerPoint, and that's what this is. And I've done this like 30 times now, and I've got another 30 or 40 booked. And so this is great. I'm making tons more money off this than the books. The books, I make four bucks. This thing, I make a couple of dollars. So anyway, so that's the story and where it all comes from. So what I'd like you to do now, if you wouldn't mind, is close your eyes and just relax. Usually there are a few people who won't do that, and that's fine. They stare at me. I don't care. But just close your eyes. And I want you to pretend you're hovering over the city of Boston. And you're looking down at a brown rectangle building with a skylight in the middle. You're facing the Fens. Up to your left is Fenway Park and the Sitco sign. Over to your right is the MFA and Northeastern and Huntington Avenue. 
If you went straight ahead, there's the Fens, uh, Snurrow Drive, Charles River, and then the other side. Okay? It's one hour after midnight, just after St. Patrick's Day ended. 1990, so March 18th, 1990, 1 a.m. There's a road to the side of that brown building. It's a one-way street going towards the Fens called Palace Road. And there's a car about 150 feet down away from a side entrance, and it's sitting idling. There are two men in, one's a little taller than the other. All of a sudden around one o'clock, they hear some people singing Irish songs. There's two couples. The girls are on the guy's shoulders. They're doing chicken fighting in the road. What, and they fall right next to the car. And they see on the driver's shoulder a Boston police patch. And they see their hats. And they're like, oh my god, we're going to get arrested. we got to get out of here. So the couple scamper away. The guys do nothing. A couple of minutes later, that side door opens up. There's a flash of light comes out and then the door is shut. They don't know what that means. Just the door opened and shut. At about 20 after one, the driver puts the car in gear, slowly glides up Palace Road on the right-hand side of the road and stops opposite the entrance. They get out of the car. They're both in full Boston police uniforms. They go up to the side entrance, hit a buzzer. Hey, let us in. We hear there's been a disturbance or the police. The guy lets them in. Then they're in a clear plastic room. They show their badges. The guy hits the buzzer again, lets them in. As soon as they're in, they say to the guy who's behind the desk, hey, come over here, we want to talk to you. He comes out from behind the desk. They grab him, slam him up against the wall, say, take his wallet, say, we know who you are, we know where you live. If you talk about this, we're going to come after you. Where's your partner? because there's two guys on duty. They give him a walkie-talkie. He calls his partner down. They slam him up against the wall. Same thing. Then they march the two of them to the basement. They don't make a wrong turn. They don't make a wrong step. They know exactly where they're going. They get to the basement. They duct tape the two of them. They put one at one end of the basement, one at the other end. They can't see each other. This takes about 20 minutes. These guys are not in a hurry. They go upstairs to the second floor to the Dutch room, start ravaging that. One of the guys goes down around the courtyard and goes to the short room or the short gallery, takes some things out of there. Back and forth, back and forth, ripping things out of walls. By the time it gets to uh, about an hour and a half later, they have all the things they want. They're down in the security area. They go to the basement to check on the two guys. They're still tied up. They take the stuff, they take a broken frame and put it on the security director's desk, or his chair, just to sort of ding them. They take the videotape, because there were cameras to the street. They take a paper tape, which documents all the movements within the museum. It takes them two trips, in, out, in, out. It's 2.45. They put the stuff in their red Dodge Daytona hatchback, drive up Palace Road, take a right-hand turn, go around the fence, and they're gone. And that's the theft. You can open your eyes. That's what happened. That's as much as we know. Now, they found up some other things after that, and I'll talk about that. But first, I'm going to talk about Isabella. She was a really interesting woman. How did she create this museum? This is a really interesting story besides her. And then we'll talk about uh, the theft, uh, how they got in, who they were. We know who got in there and did it. Who gave them the police uniforms, we know that. A whole bunch of guys who got killed, we know that. And then we'll talk, I'll talk a little bit about where the stuff might be. Because there are a lot of different places it could be. So that's the Dutch room after they got through with it. And I'll keep walking around so you all can see it. I don't want to interfere. But you can see they took really no uh, care of what they were doing. Oh, good, this thing works. If one of these screens is glass, when I go like this, the red dot disappears, and then I'm like pointing all night, which is a pain. So this is the courtyard. Uh, this is the tapestry room. They went in there for a second and came out. 
Uh, the guy who went down the short gallery went this way and around to the other side of the courtyard. But you can see they just tore everything apart, right? These were not art lovers. Component, like I said, I'm going to talk about, about Isabella, what was taken. There were other attempts to get into this museum as well as the MFA. This was the only one that was successful. I'll go through the theft in a little more detail. I'll tell you who did it, because we know that. That's kind of easy. They're dead by the and, uh, and then where did the stuff go? So I'll talk about Isabella and, how, and where, what her life was like. And, and she was uh, a very interesting, eccentric woman. And especially at the time, you know, uh, women didn't have the right to vote. They didn't have lots of other rights. But she was very out there. And, uh, so that's, and that and a lot of money was how she was able to create all of this. So uh, about two months ago, my wife and I went to a presentation at the Gardner where it talked about Isabella and how she managed her image. And she was very image conscious. So there are very few photos of her. There are a lot of paintings and sketches because she could sort of tell the artist, I want to look like blah. Thank you, sir. But this is what she really looked like. So that's her as a young girl. That's her uh, uh, engagement picture with her husband, Jack. That's her with her one son. So she had a son, unfortunately he died fairly young. She had another uh, pregnancy that ended in miscarriage and that was sort of the end of that. And that became their reason that they went traveling and spent their money in buying art because that's what they were gonna devote their lives to. So this is her a little bit older, 1888. Uh, so the, she was very active in the building of her museum. So I don't know if you can see it, but this is her up on a, a ladder, right? There's her, she's climbing up the ladder. You see all these pictures? She's up there telling like, no, no, this goes here, this goes here, this goes here. She was not a standoffish owner. This is her in her mystic period. <laughs> and that's her uh, later in life. Now these are some of the other images of her. So that's a painting by John Singer Sargent that's in the museum. This doesn't do it justice, it's just gorgeous. Uh, this, those two were done by a guy named Anders Zorn. And these things around her head are supposed to be diamonds. See the diamond headdress, whatever you want to call it, put up there. So this is how she wanted people to see her. The other was what she really was. So this is a, an article in the Boston Globe that she borrowed a lion from the Franklin Park Zoo and walked it up Boylston Street. Okay, she was not your basic normal woman. And the Globe said this has happened, so we'll say it's true. Uh, she would uh, drink beer, smoke cigarettes, play get backgammon, and she drove her car very fast. Oh my God, what a horrible woman. <laughs> But as somebody said, she's the millionaire bohemian, she's the eccentric leader of the smart set. She was sort of a leader of art, artism, art, art and artistic works in Boston. People gravitated to her. So she was born in 1840 in New York to a wealthy father, married Jack Gardner. He was like from Gloucester or something. He had a lot of money. Um, like I said, she had one child and <coughs> unfortunately not another. And then they decided to travel in Europe and collect their art. Her dad died and left her 1.8 million, which is 78 million today. Not, not horrible. Uh, then her husband died, and she got all that money. Uh, but she, they were already planning to start the museum. So she just kept going. You know, it didn't matter to her that he had passed away. This was going to be what she wanted to do. Which is sort of why if you go there, um, not, nothing is marked. Right, you can get a, a, an audio thing, but she never marked it, and they can't put those there because they can't change things because it would break her will, mm -hmm. which I'll show you in a little bit. Uh, so the museum opened in 1903. She lived on the fourth floor. That side entrance I talked about uh, was her private entrance at the time. Now it's boarded up and you can't go in there, but that's how she went in. So now the fourth floor is administrative offices and two or 3,000 pieces of art that you will never, ever see, <coughs> ever. And it's because of something that she said. And then she died and left uh, 1.2 million to the museum, which again is a decent amount of money, except for something, and we'll get to that. 
So this is where she lived before they put the museum up. So 150 was built by her father, and then 152 was built by her husband. So this was on Beacon Street. Unfortunately, those buildings were purchased by a member of the Draper family, Draper Labs, and they tore the buildings down. So that's what it looks like now. But there is a little sign that says this is where she lived. So if you'll go, you know, it's down sort of towards the public garden, you know, down, down that end. So just in case you don't know, so that's where the gardener is, right? Here's the Fens, here's Fenway Park, here's the MFA, here's Northeastern Huntington Avenue. I talked, so I, I, I want you to remember three things, just three. Whoop. First one is Palace Road. Palace Road is very important in all this. And Palace Road is this road here, going this way towards the fence. So just as another way of seeing where the gardener is, map of Boston. So there's the fence. Uh-oh. <laughs> Whitey Bulger territory. <laughs> so I'll, I won't do it now. I've got a quick right, Whitey Bulger story that was real. So when people come to this, I have like 20, a list of 20 people who have some connection with the theft who come to these things. And if any of you do, I would love to hear your stories because they're more and more interesting. I've met FBI agents who were on the case, all sorts of people. Anyway, so there's Whitey Bulger territory there. So the second thing I want you to remember is TRC Auto Electric uh, in Dorchester. 1325 Dorchester Avenue in Dorchester. And the other thing I want you to remember is the city of Revere, right? Six miles north. So, Palace Road, TRC, Revere. If you remember that, you're going to remember most of the story. Okay. So, the gardener, in case you haven't been there, the building itself is the museum. Ceilings, floors, walls, archways are all things that she brought back. Right? This wasn't just, oh, here's a bunch of walls, we're going to hang some stuff. It's not that. And as somebody said, you know, or somebody, a yeah, letter to Isabella, if she inherited the mo enough money, she would have a house with beautiful pictures and let people see it. And that's what she did. You know, she was able to fulfill her dream. So this is a hotel that they stayed at in Venice. And this was part of her inspiration for the gardener. The other is this. And those balconies, she brought back with her. Mm -hmm. Eight of those balconies are in the gardener itself. She did not spare expense. So when you're walking around there, you know, it's like, oh, this floor. Oh, yeah, it was from a 1500 Spanish monastery, whatever. It's just, you know, you've got to be aware of everything. So this is what the courtyard looks like, if, you know, if you haven't been there. Especially, you know, you go there in the winter and it's bright and green and all that. So this is uh, the second floor. Uh, this is where the um, Dutch room was. The short room is around this end. So this is what the Fenway looked like before she got started. It was sort of on the outskirts of Boston. It wasn't a nice area, right? And she bought land. The MFA had been built, but this had not. I think the MFA opened a couple of years before hers. Um, but she changed it to that, right? And that's what it looks like now. There's Palace Road coming this way. There's the Fens this way. This is all the new section back here. So the, to me, the big question is, why was this museum so vulnerable? This is world-class stuff. Like these 13 items are worth half a billion. So the whole thing must have been worth, I don't know, 10. Pick a number. Tons of zeros. So why could people break in so easily? And unfortunately, the reason was Isabella's will. She gave them 1.2 million, but said you could only spend the income so if you do some quick math, like 10% of 1.2 is $120,000. You can't run a museum on $120,000. You have to scrimp and not have air conditioning and not pay your guards and not have enough alarms and not have backups. Da, 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 da. So unfortunately, her limits and they had a board of directors that was not great at raising money. So between those two things, it just wasn't a, wasn't a very secure place. And there's something else. So I'll summarize this, but it basically says, if anybody moves any piece of art, one, then everything in the museum gets sold, 
the building gets sold and all the money goes to Harvard. That was her wish. She wanted things to be how she wanted things to be. Well, so that means they, that's why that stuff in the fourth floor you'll never see. They can't sell stuff, not that they would want to, but you know, they may, maybe they could sell some stuff, but they never had that opportunity because of her will. I'm also talking a little fast because this may run out of juice and I really don't want to do this without it, but I'll get there. So that video camera I was talking about onto Palace Road, no backup. The, they had untrained, and you'll see who the guards were there, not impressive, they're not like ex-FBI agents or Secret Service guys. Okay. Uh, there was no auto alarm, so normally if guards walk around, they put a thing in it says, here, I was here, ch -ch 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 -ch, here, I was here. None, nothing like that. And there was nothing that said if an alarm gets punched, it goes to the Boston Police Department, except there was one behind the desk, and they took the guy out from behind the desk. That's why they grabbed them. So after that, the place was blind. Uh, it was very poor climate control. There was plastic sheets over paintings. There were rubber mats. There was no air conditioning or humidity control. It was just awful for these priceless pieces of art. And they just you know, didn't do basic maintenance. So what was taken? So there's 13 items. So there's a couple of biggies. So there's this, a Vermeer. And it's a little small, but it says it's worth $250 million or more. There's only 30 or 32 Vermeers in the world. By the way, uh, the movie uh, Girl with the Pearl Earring, really good, really good movie. Uh, but so that's a Vermeer, that's worth a ton. Then there's this, a Rembrandt Storm in the Sea of Galilee. It's the only water one he did. That one's worth, I don't know, 100 million or you know, pick your number. Uh, there's this one, that's what I stole, put on the cover of my book. And that one's worth 10 million or maybe more. There's this, is Shea Tortoni. There's this, a landscape with obelisk. That one's worth 100 million. There's this little thing that's two inches by two inches. And I saw somewhere where that's worth 250 million. A little stamp-like thing, but it's Rembrandt. So it's good stuff. So clearly there's tons. And so this is what the room looked like. So that's where the lady and gentleman in black used to be. So why the frames are back up is like her will said, everything has to be like it was. So they can't put like a poster of, I don't know, dogs playing poker, right? They've got to put something up, so they put up the frames, right? Uh, so there's the Storm of the Sea, Galilee. So I don't know if you can see it, but right there, see that little white dot? That was a Chinese vase or a goo or a coup. They took that. Odd thing to take, but we'll get to that too. Uh, that's where the concert was. On the back side was where the uh, obelisk was. So that little, uh, so that was not taken. That's a Rembrandt. That little thing was in there, like right in that little corner. This is the corridor down to the short gallery where they took some other stuff. Oh, that Rembrandt they call it three mustaches because it looks like he sort of has three mustaches. And that's the, what's showing the landscape. So landscape and the Vermeer were sort of back to back. So this is the short room. So there's a couple of things that were taken in there. So one is, see this flag here? This was Napoleon's flag. So aside from that, he was short, right? Uh, they needed something to find him during a battle. So he had his first regiment around him, and he had a, a flag you know, that was up in the air. So that was his flag. But on top of that was an eagle. Uh-oh, you're going to get thrown out? Yep. Yep. Oh. So there was an eagle on top, and it was called a finial. And that eagle was taken. They did not take the flag. So that was back in there. And the other thing they took were five sketches by Degas. Now, not to minimize Degas, but he's not Rembrandt. And there were pencil sketches. And they were in, so I don't know how many things are in here. All right, one, two, three, four, five, six or seven. They went six or seven deep to get the ones that they wanted for some reason. But we'll get to that too. So it's sort of an odd selection of why going in there. Yeah, sort of weird. So this is the finial. 
uh, uh, from his Imperial Guard. So a couple of years ago, so I have a bunch of stories. This is when the stories start. So a guy who was a jeweler on Washington Street came forward, and he said a couple of months after the theft, a guy named Bobby Donati came to him and said, hey, I have an eagle, you want to buy it? And his answer was, Jesus, why don't you just steal the Mona Lisa? <laughs> right? What am I going to do with a finial? I mean, except sell it to somebody from Boston College. But what are you going to do with an, with an eagle that everybody knows is stolen? You can't. Right? So the guy, so Donati, you know, took off. That was the only sighting of any of the items that were taken. That's the only one. Oh, she got the power cord. Yay! It's my wife. Hi. Wow, this is quite the problem. I know, it's what I thought. Who knew this many people knew who I was? All right, so at some point I will take a quick break and do that, but I think I'm okay. Um, so these are the sketches by Degas. Three of them are of <coughs> jockeys. And I'm sure they're like world class, it's Degas and all that, but it's not Vermeer, right? So this is a list of what she bought and what she paid for things. So it's kind of interesting, right? So, oops, a little sideways. Let's see, I'll like, uh-oh. All right, we'll go like that. So, so that little Rembrandt, the thing that's worth a couple hundred million, she paid $120 for, right? Uh, there, uh, the Che Tortoni, she paid a bit. Uh, the Eagle, not much. That Chinese vase, she paid seventeen thousand five hundred for. Oh, wow. But it's you know different times, different right. things value. You know who knows. <coughs> but so she paid one hundred forty-two thousand dollars for stuff that's worth pick a number and add eight zeros. A lot of a lot of money. So these are some. I just I found these. So any of you do genealogy? Right, you, know, you, you get a thread and you, go, and you go down it and it's like down a rabbit hole. So I go down rabbit holes on this stuff once in a while and I found all these receipts and checks of hers. So this is the receipt for buying the Shea Tortoni. This is uh, the shipping for the Degas. I don't know if see where it is. Here it says Degas. This is all oh, the items that were held in France. So there's a Rubens. And there's a Rembrandt, so this was like an inventory. This is, oh, the receipt for buying the small Rembrandt, the three moustache. It's like right here, it says, O trois moustache, 120. This is, oh, her, the receipt for the Vermeer. Where does it say Vermeer? Oh yeah, right there, see, this is the concert. There's that one. Uh, this is, she bought, she also, she bought that flag this is the receipt for the flag. She bought that someplace in New York, I think. Yeah. Um, this is a cable that they had received, a Rembrandt. And this is her personal check for half of the vase. Right? And uh, and then, you know, it's just interesting finding a check. I just thought that was good. That was an accountant. You know, I think that's good. <laughs> anyway. So the big, so on top of how did these people get in? So it was basically because the place was open, wide open, and there's some other stuff. But why were these things taken? So like I said, I was doing research for this thing, you know, trying to fill up my PowerPoint, and I came across a guy somewhere like in Reddit somewhere who had this theory. And so this is the 1984 guidebook for the gardener. And if you go to the page, for the Dutch room, guess what things are listed? The Chinese coup and the Rembrandt. And look what's written up, the obelisk. The things that are, just, that are described on these pages are what was taken, which is really weird. It's almost like somebody said, you know, to their stupid husband, oh, here's the list, can I have a hand for it and get this? You go to a stop and shop and get this stuff. They just gave lists out and said, find this stuff. Huh. I don't think the guys who broke in were any smarter than that. Oh, and there were five Degas taken. Guess which ones were listed? Hmm. The ones were taken. So I've never heard a better, th so, uh, I was in Bourne. 
and there was a woman right back there, standing right back there, and I get to this part, and she's standing there and she goes, you're wrong. <laughs> and that's perfectly fine. I'm just a guy and I did some research and I found stuff out. But I went up to her afterwards and I said, why are you saying I'm wrong? She said, well, my better half was a strong arm hitman for the mafia. <laughs> and I looked her up, I got her name, I looked her up and her husband, her husband was that. She said, and all of the items that were stolen were uh, picked ahead of time and shipped out of the country the next day. Okay. Now, three or four years ago, I was in the hospital for a heart thing, I was fine. But I had a roommate, and he and I started talking, and he's a little older than I am. <clears throat> and he's like, so what do you do in retirement? I said, well, I'm writing this book, Duped on the Gardner Museum Theft. And he starts laughing at me. Mm -hmm. I'm like, okay, John, why are you laughing at me? He says, well, I can't tell you, I'll have to kill you. <laughs> he, he was kidding. But he wouldn't tell me. So I'm there for three days, and Monday I'm getting out. So finally I go around the curtain, sit on his bed. It's like, John, you've got to tell me why you're telling me that I'm wrong. He said, well, I was in Korea and got out and you know, worked in the restaurant industry. And <clears throat> I finally got up to where I own my own restaurant. And my partner was Whitey Bulger. <laughs> but it was a straight restaurant. It wasn't a hangout for like bad guys, Weeks and Flemmy and those guys. He was a straight, and he said, he looked at me, he goes, I'm telling you, Whitey did it. <laughs> so I got one woman telling me, no, it's all these other things happen. And this guy telling me that Whitey did it. So, you know, it's like the Kennedy assassination. There's like eight theories. I think there's enough theories to go around on this thing, too. So I know two of them. <clears throat> like I said, I meet really interesting people doing these things. <laughs> So this is the Shea Tortoni. That's the uh, site where it is now. It's very small. That's the only item from the blue room, which is on the first floor. It's the only item listed in that book. Mm -hmm. So there's like three. You know, one is OK. Two is maybe a coincidence. Three, sorry, I don't buy that it's a coincidence anymore. But I like that. It's a very simple theory. I'm a simple guy. I like that one. So what wasn't taken? that. They started to take it off the wall, but didn't. Oh, a, a Rubens, right? They didn't take a Rubens. And they didn't take the Titian. And the, you know, the gardener had the four of them together. But this was very big. It was six, seven feet, six by seven or something. It was on the third floor. They never went up there. So they never took that, the, these things. But there were clearly other hugely valuable, nice pieces of art that they never went near. So there were prior attempts to get in. There was activity the night before the theft. Um, I'll go through the theft and I'll tell you who did it. And then where the stuff might have gone. So a decade before the theft, um, the gardener got a call from the FBI and said, we have a tip that you're going to get robbed. When I did my first presentation in Gardner, Mass., the, uh, a guy came up to me and said he was the head of security in the gardener at this meeting. Mm -hmm. And he said, yeah, they came in and told us that we did some stuff and we never got robbed, but you know, we had a warning a decade ahead. But they didn't have money to do much, but they still had that. Two months before the theft, two guys appear at the back of the Museum of Fine Arts in police uniforms. Hey, let us in. We hear there's been a disturbance. Security guard says, I can't let you in. I have to go find my supervisor. So he goes running around the MFA, which takes him like eight years to find his <laughs> boss and get back. And by the time he gets back, the two guys are gone. But two guys tried to talk their way into the MFA two months ahead. Except the MFA never told anybody. Huh. They didn't tell the gardener. They didn't tell the cops. They told. They kept it a secret. Great. Two weeks before the theft, Two men are beating up a guy on Palace Road. He breaks free. He runs to the side entrance. Hey, let me in, let me in, I'm getting beat up. Guard says, I can't let you in. The guy walks away, gets in the car with the two guys who are beating him up and drives away. <laughs> Dry run? Sounds like it. The night before the theft, three people went into the gardener after one o'clock night before, the date of 24 hours ahead. And we know this because the FBI released the video. It's always the video, right? It's, it's a tape. Mix it and ask any, it's always tapes. Everybody gets caught on tapes. 
Um, so I've taken some screenshots of what happened the night before. So it's about 1 a.m. the night before. And this is an older security guard. Uh, I, I've never been able to find his name. He has nothing to do with anything. He was not on duty the night of the theft. He was just an old guy who was a security guard. That was it. But you can see it's a little before 1 o'clock, 3.17, right, the night before. And so he's in front of the uh, security desk, and another guy is sitting behind him. So here's the other guard. He's on the phone. It's you know a little before 1 o'clock. He's talking to somebody. Here's this guy. There's an alarm, so there's two buttons here. There's one <laughs> alarm to the cops, and there's one alarm to let people in. So there's two buttons back there. So this guy is a guy named Richard Rick Abath. He's the one who was in the paper about three weeks ago, passed away. Um, he had nothing to do with anything as far as they can tell, except he was stupid, right? He let people in, he hit buzzers. He was just, just wrong guy, wrong place, wrong time. He, uh, he never had great wealth. He passed lie detector tests. He was a teacher, just a guy. Um, somebody in one of these, uh, they said their cousin was married to him. So we like to be called Rick, but it's just a regular guy, just having to make some mistakes. So this, so it's 4719 here, so here's 4810. This is a car coming the wrong way. Remember I said Palace Road went one way to the fence? This car is going the wrong way on Palace Road, parallel to the museum. So here's 4839, a couple of seconds later. Right? And the older guy is leaving. 4858, the car, right here, that's a car. It's turned around, and you, it's hard to see. So I'm going to call it a guy, because we have no idea if it was a guy or a girl. But there's, those are legs right there. So there's somebody got out of, parked the car, turned it off, got out, and they're walking towards that side entrance. Okay. Just like me to over that. So here at 49.15, Abath is hitting the button, the buzzer, to let whoever this is in. So why are you letting any, who wants to get into the gardener at 1 a.m.? What's the point? So there have been things like, well, somebody forgot their keys. At 1 a.m., why, like, wait till the morning? Just why are people getting lent into this place? No idea. So here's a little bit later, 4925, not much longer, but you can see a much better picture. This person, this guy, is walking away from the gardener to his car. So 4939, he starts the car, lights are on. There's a second person there. They're going into the museum. They're at that side door. That's two. Where did he come from? He didn't, if you watch this, he did not get out of that car. He was on foot from somewhere. Again, why? And so 49, so here's Abath here. Here's this person, whoever it is, they're here. So they've gotten in. So if you pass, fast forward, here's a guy at 5300 walking in. That's not Abath, because he had long stringy hair. And it sure isn't the old guy. So there's another guy getting in. He's not dressed up as a cop. Oh, no, no. These so, are so there's three people then? Yeah, the yeah. Okay, so at 5310, somebody leaves the museum. Here's the car. But the car drives away, and this person does not get in the car. So it's like, what are they having, a cake party or something? <laughs> they're, they're going in and out, in and out. Nobody knows why. People are just getting let in. You know, it's funny, they didn't mention this at all yeah. in the Isabel Gardner heist. I just right, in the Netflix thing? But is this no, no, the, the days book, before? Oh, the book? Yeah. yeah. Okay. They didn't mention anything of the night before. I'm an all-service guy. Yeah, that's interesting. <laughs> the ABAP didn't have an explanation for why they were there. <laughs> no. They must be I, I, You know, I've not been able to find that. I should look for that. Yeah. But not, not that I've come across, but it's a okay. very good question. Um, so 53.30, the car drives away, there's somebody here. So part of the explanation is that this guy is this guy. 
And this guy is the, was the assistant director of security. And to my naked eye, he doesn't look anything like that guy. This guy's sort of thicker. He's thin. Forget the coat. Just seems to have a different frame. And this is the guy who went in. So it just looks to me like that's not the guy. It was like, so somebody said it was him, it wasn't. Okay, so let's talk about the 18th. So we know about the partiers. I told you about the red Dodge Daytona hatchback, right? That's the car they were driving. Um, I told you about the security guards. So I'm gonna go through the theft and then the discovery the next morning by the next sh shift that was coming up. So uh, the partiers were just kids, you know, and they gave their statements, but they didn't see much. They saw the car, they saw the patch, but that was it. So they really couldn't identify the, the guys who went in. And they were just like college kids, and they gave their statements, and they were partially drunk anyway, so, you know, the cops just said, go away. Because they didn't have just a lot of value to it. So that's what an 88 Red Dodge Daytona hatchback looks like. And that's the car from the night before. So it seems to me they're pretty close. I mean, this thing is not, you know, a Dodge minivan. It's not a Ferrari. You know, it's not a Corvette Stingray. They sort of look alike to me. So this, that's Rich Abat, Rick. <laughs> so he had a band called Uriah, and that's where they lived in Alston, Brighton. And they threw $5 cake parties, right? Come in, five bucks, all you can drink, and dance and do whatever you want. So that was him. The night after the theft, he went to a Grateful Dead concert in Hartford. <laughs> right? He really, you know, if he had done something, he probably wouldn't be going to a Dead concert, I would think. Oh, and that replacement guard, the second one, was a guy named Randy Hestet. Nothing to do with anything. He was just called in at the last minute and just... Wrong guy, wrong, wrong place. So this is what, you know, the gardener, just a cutaway. So this is Palace Road here. This is the Dutch room up here. There's the side entrance. There's the short gallery. And that one painting, the uh, Shea Tortoni, was taken from the first floor. And that's down here, the blue room. So I'm gonna put this up fast. You can read faster than I can talk, probably. But I'll highlight a couple of things. But you know, they sort of get there. They get uh, they get let in. They get the second guard. They tie them up, put them down the basement, right? So they're not taking their time. That's 21 minutes. And then they go up to the second floor, and they go in and out. One goes down to the tapestry room, comes back. One goes down to uh, the short room. So they're just back and forth, back and forth. And then for 15 minutes, there's no movement at all. None. Where did these guys go? You know, maybe there weren't security um, sensors in the bathrooms. I, who knows? But it was 15 minutes of no activity. The machines were working fine because all of a sudden, they sensed them again. And then it goes silent again. Very odd activity. going down very closely with something. Right? Oh, you're just trying to follow it? Okay. I'm looking at the times with the no movement. Yeah, it's 15 minutes and 11. So then from 2.40 to 2.45, they go in and out twice. They put that frame on the security director's desk. They take the videotape. They take a paper tape, which records the sensor of where everybody was at different times. And then, God Maybe God, which is also a great movie and a really good book. Yeah. Uh, I love that movie. Uh, ben Affleck did it with Casey Affleck. But anyway, so they're, so they're out of there. So this is just sort of a schematic, just to give you, and, and the time frame on the bottom. So, you know, they're coming in here, taking them down the basement, coming up, going here, around, around, go in there a little bit, come down this way, back, da 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 come back, go back down the basement, make sure the guys are tied up. Th um, this whole thing is on my um, website. Oh, very good. And uh, a recording of this. And a recording I did for a TV station. I'm, I'm just like world fit now. <laughs> no, it was Upton TV, it was like two people saw it. <laughs> um, so this is the side entrance. 
the, de the day of the theft, and this is what it looks like now. When my wife and I went to the presentation, I just snapped another picture. So there was some odd stuff that ABAC did. So remember I had you, when you close your eyes, I said the door opened and the light went out? He opened the door, he said he did. He said he was checking the alarm, making sure it was working, which makes no sense to me, but he did it, right? He also went through the blue room twice. The two fake cops never ever went in the blue room. Huh. The only one who went in the blue room that night was him. Why he did that, and did he take that Shea Tortoni and leave it for them, or who knows? Maybe this was the 15 minutes somehow the guys were unaccounted for. They don't know. Right, and he's the one who, like I said, opened and shut that door. So when I said we know what the movements were, the only thing that the fake cops didn't know was that there were two tapes paper tapes. There was only one video, but two tapes that monitored where people were. They took one, but they didn't take the second. And so this is a picture of the second one, and you can see it says, someone is in the Dutch room, investigate immediately. Yeah, no kidding, right? And it keep, but it keeps saying the same thing because nobody can see it. It's not tied to anything other than the tape machine. It's just like, So the next morning, the next shift comes on, and they open the door, and you know they don't see the guards. They don't know if there's. Uh, they see the frame. They don't know if people are dead. They don't know if the thieves are there. They don't know where the guards are. So they eventually go downstairs, and this is, this is what a bath looked like. But if you notice, there's a knife behind him. No explanation. I don't know why that knife was stood there. But there's a, a knife behind him. He was at one end. So if you look at this. Now remember, he's been tied up since a little before one until like seven or eight a.m. I would think he would look a little worse for wear, mm -hmm. and not to be too indelicate, but you know, yeah. did he have to go to the bathroom? It's just like, he looks pretty good for a guy who's been tied up for a long time. Or maybe they only tied him up at the end, right? Maybe they separated them so that he wasn't even tied up down in the basement. And he just sat there, and then the last thing they did was, okay, we'll put a little duct tape around your head, and then we're gonna leave. So what do we know about the thieves? We know um, that there were people going in the night before. We know the, the car. We know the timeline from the security system. But the security guards, uh, Abath and Hestead, did see the guys. So we have sketches. So this is the short, this is the taller of the two guys. And they, you know, glasses on both, mustache, no mustache. This is the shorter guy, mustache, no mustache. And these are the descriptions. Now you have to remember, these people are under a lot of stress. It's very easy not to remember things like you really saw them, or to forget them, or to make them up, or to fill in blanks without any bad things accommodate, you know, going with that. So, so the thief number one, Abath said, gold square glasses, has said no glasses. Hested said a Boston accent. The other guy said, nope, no accent. Over here, uh, hair was black and short. Mustache, none. Mustache, yes. Hested said the second guy had chubby cheeks, whatever that means. So there were slight differences in their descriptions. Did they give them a lie detector test? No. Yeah, of course. Yep. So who did it? Was it an inside job? Was it, was it really Rick Abath? Was it the security guard? Was it who knows who? Somebody else inside? Was it freelance art thieves? Was it Pierce Brosnan? You know, or the Pink Panther? Or take your pick, somebody breaking in and then selling the stuff all over the world and there's a book about them. Who knows? Uh, was it the mafia? Well, which one? Right? There's the Italian mafia in Boston. There's the Italian Marf mafia in Rhode Island. There's uh, Whitey Bulger's mafia. There's the Irish mafia in Charlestown. Take your pick, right? There's a lot of candidates. Of course, so I grew up in New Jersey, so we just call them jamokes. Was it just a couple of jamokes? Just a couple of idiots who broke in and got the stuff and didn't know what to do with them. It's possible, right? So it could be any of these guys. So here's a couple of, so here's 
A bath, I personally would have lost the stringy hair, but you know, that's a fashion statement. But he had, like I said, no sign of wealth after. Uh, there's nothing that says he did anything past lie detector tests. So now there's a bunch of other folks they looked at. There's a guy named Brian McDevitt, and he tried to uh, steal from uh, a museum, and he was dressed up as a FedEx driver, but he got caught. He was living on Beacon Hill the day of the theft. But he's got a beard and a mustache, and those guards were scared, but they weren't that scared, right? They would not miss that. So it really wasn't him. And right after it, he told his girlfriend he was paid to rob the gardener, and he had to go to Hollywood. And uh, personally, I think he was just breaking up with her, but you know, whatever. And he went out there and tried to write movies, and he was a failure and disappeared from anything. So he didn't do it. So then there's this guy, Miles Connor, uh, who's a pretty famous guy. His dad was a police chief in the South Shore. He was a intel very intelligent guy. He was also head of a rock band called The Wild Ones. He just put out a doc, somebody did a documentary on him, whatever. Um, he stole paintings with Bobby Donati. Remember, Bobby Donati is the one with the finial who went to the guy. Okay, so you're gonna start see hearing names multiple times here. Um, Connor stole a painting from the MFA, and that's him in later life. Uh, he cased the gardener way before the theft with Donati. So Donati was like a teenager. And Connor, uh, he was friends with the guy William Dunworth, we'll get to, and he's passed. He was in, but he was in jail the day of the theft, so he didn't do it, but he was certainly smart enough to know how to do it. And he's passed away. So there's another guy named David Houghton. So he dated Miles Connor's sister. He also doesn't look like the guy who went in because he weighs 350 pounds, and those guards were not that scared again. He visited Connor in jail and said, can you give me tips on how to get into the gardener? Huh. And so Miles Connor gave him tips. But <clears throat> um, and he sold Connor, hold, held Connor's art. Uh, but he weighed 350 pounds. He definitely didn't do it. And he died in 1992, two years after the theft. But this is going to be a recurring theme. So there's another guy named Lewis Rice. And when I said there was an FBI tip a decade ahead, he's the guy who gave the tip to the FBI. And he gave the tip because he slept in the gardener as a kid. He came from a very tough family. His father was very abusive. When he wanted to get out of the house, he would just not sleep in his house. He would go in the gardener during regular hours slip up to the fourth floor, get under a table that had a tablecloth on it, and he'd sleep there. And in the morning, he'd get up and reverse it and go do whatever, and then come back that night. So he knew the gardener inside out. He watched the, 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 uh, the guards. Um, he cased the gardener. He gave that tip to the FBI. He owned a thing called A to Z Trading, and he fenced stolen art. So you know he was not a choir boy. Uh, he robbed a Newton house. And when he got caught, he said, I'll give you the paintings back if I don't have to go to jail, which is also a recurring theme. You get caught, just turn the stuff back, and nobody cares anymore. They got the paintings back. So those are the two sketches. How's that? What do you think? Pretty close? So the guy on the left, his name is George Jamaica Plain Ricefelder. And the guy on the right is Lenny the Mutt de Muzio. <clears throat> I mean, they're mafia guys. They have to have good names, right? So they, they make up their names. So those are the two guys who went in and did it, right? They're the guys who are in the police uniforms who went into the gardener and stole the stuff. 99.9%. .9%. That's who did it. But that's not really important because they weren't the guys who planned it, and they certainly weren't the guys who had the paintings. So here's George going to jail another time, smiling for the camera. <laughs> Guess what car he owned? He owned an 88 Red Dodge Daytona hatchback. And he worked at, remember I told you, remember three things? TRC Auto Electric. His sister-in-law said she saw the Shea Tortoni on his bedroom wall once. 
She later sort of recanted and said, maybe it was just a finger painting, but whatever. But she said she saw it. Unfortunately, about a year after the theft, he died of a coke overdose. And his body was found by a guy named Carmelo Merlino. Carmelo Merlino owned TRC Auto Electric. He also, wrote, he also ran a cocaine ring for the Patriarchas out of his TRC Auto Electric. They would take the box, like, the, like for parts, they take the parts out, put the cocaine in, distribute it that way. His body was found, <clears throat> so he died of a coke overdose. His body was found by his boss, who ran a cocaine ring. <laughs> so you wonder if George was like, you know, he got a few extra bucks from the theft. He's bragging about that he's got a few extra bucks. Somebody figures out, hey, this guy knows where the paintings are. Uh, let's beat him up until he talks, and if he doesn't, we'll kill him with cocaine. Not a horrible idea. Then there's Lenny. He was a mechanic at <laughs> audience participation, please. Thank you. He disappeared a year after the theft, but they didn't find him for three months. But when they did, he was in the trunk of a car in East Boston, beaten to death. And he was allegedly killed by a guy named David Turner because he stole money from Turner. So there's two guys gone. So this is David Turner. So remember I said chubby cheeks? Mm -hmm. So maybe that, but the issue was he was in Florida the day of the theft. So he couldn't do it, but he allegedly killed, oh, and one of the, um, the kids said one of the guys had maybe had slanted eyes, but I don't know. Uh, but he worked at TRC on electric, and he's the one who allegedly killed Lenny the Mutt. He, he just got out of jail. He's one of the few people still alive from all this. So here's TRC Auto Electric. You can get your car there fixed now if you want. It's under different ownership. I don't think it uh, distributes cocaine anymore. But that's what it looks like right now. So this is Carmelo Merlino, clearly a handsome guy. So he, like I said, he owned uh, the uh, TRC. He was a patriarch underboss. He was convicted of an armed robbery. Um, he, not one of the Gardner paintings, but he exchanged another painting to get out of jail. He was caught on a wire a few years after the theft talking about it. Not that he had the stuff, but he was discussing it with someone. And he was criminals, he worked with some other guys. And he passed away in prison. So these are all the folks who worked at TRC. So there's George, there's Lenny. There's Donati, the guy Bobby Donati with the finial, he worked there. David Turner worked there. David Houghton, big guy, worked there. Tony Romano, he was wearing the wire that caught Mer Merlino talking about it. <clears throat> and then there's Carmelo Merlino. So all these guys connected to the theft worked at TRC Auto Electric. But the two guys who went in really weren't bright enough to do this, so who planned it? So. Was it Whitey? Notwithstanding what my hospital roommate told me, this really wasn't a Whitey thing. Like his thing was, oh, you want a million dollar lottery ticket? I'm gonna steal it from you or kill you, <laughs> right? Or uh, you own a liquor store. I, I would like that liquor store, so I'm gonna take it from you. Thank you very much. And he didn't. So I have a, a quick story about Whitey. So a woman was sitting in one of, the, uh, one of these presentations. And before I started, she says, I have a Whitey story for you. So said, okay, tell me. So, yes. yes, they're oh. so these are the um, police reports. So um, she was on the South Shore in Squanton, which is north of Quincy, and she was looking at a house, and she was in her room, bedroom, and a guy was in there, and he just gave her the absolute creeps. It's like something about him was just scary. And then his blonde girlfriend came in. Oh, I love this house, blah, blah, blah. So the woman goes downstairs, talks to a realtor, says, I want to buy this house, so I'll pay full price, Call me tomorrow and tell me that I've gotten it. Mm -hmm. Goes away. Next day, no call from a realtor. So she calls the realtor up late in the day. What happened to my offer? I made a full price offer. Oh, you didn't get the house. Why not? Well, the guy in the bedroom was Whitey Bulger, and he walked in with a bag of cash and said <laughs> to the owner, I am buying your house. Yeah. And did. 
So, and she, uh, her parents lived in that area, and she would be on the beach where he walked. And he would see her, and I don't think he recognized her, you know, but he would always just say, you know, hi, how you doing, walking this little white dog. But this, so what Whitey's thing was more uh, taking 15% of all the crime in his area. And he asked uh, Fleming and Weeks to go find out who robbed the gardener, because he wanted 15% of half a billion. <laughs> so, but if he's doing that, he didn't steal Right, so it's, and Whitey, he was just a kill guy. He was not a, oh, let's plan a nice robbery guy. <laughs> Jeremy, any of you remember the Valhalla? Gun running, IRA? So this boat took off from, I forget, Marblehead or Gloucester, loaded with ice for fish and guns. And it was Whitey who supplied the guns. The guns go across the Atlantic, they get landed. The guy who's from the IRA is a double agent. He turns the guns over to the British government, the ship comes back, everybody gets arrested. So one theory is Whitey's trying to make up for losing the guns by stealing the paintings and giving them to the IRA, and then they could sell them to somebody and get money to buy guns, and that's just way too convoluted for my brain. But it's a theory. So that's, that's the Valhalla theory. So then here's this guy, Bobby Donati, right here. So he was a driver for a guy named Vinny the Animal Ferrara. <laughs> Vinny was in jail. So one th when the theft happened, so one theory is Donati did this to get the paintings to exchange for his boss to get him out of jail. Entirely possible. Uh, he cased the gardener with uh, Connor. He stole some paintings. He worked at TRC, of course, like we all did. Um, and the night before the theft, in Revere, remember, third thing, Revere, he, was, he had a paper bag with two complete Boston police uniforms that he was showing to people. It's like, look at this, I've got Boston police uniforms. He had two of them the night before. So it seems pretty likely that he's the guy who at least had the uniforms to give to the guys and maybe he paid them and then they went in and did it, came out, gave him the stuff because he had the eagle, right, that he tried to sell. Right? Um, yeah. So unfortunately, Bobby Donati is dead. Okay. Uh, so he was killed on his porch. Um, I love this line from the cops. At this point, we have no suspects and no witnesses. Unfortunately, in this kind of case, not too many witnesses come forward. <laughs> yeah. So, um, so a friend of mine lived in Revere on Point of Pines. It's Italian. And I give him my books to read ahead of time, and he tells me what's good or what's bad. But uh, so I'm writing Duped, and he says to me, uh, I have a cousin who's in the mafia who lives in Revere. Do you want to talk to him? Like, absolutely, I want to talk to him. No, he's not like a killer made guy. He's just sort of, you know, runs stuff around the mafia. So we went to this guy's house and talked to him for two or three hours. Great stories. I put a bunch of them in the book. Uh, and then I said, I want to see where Donati was killed. I want to see where his body was found. I want to see where all the mafia guys lived. So he drove me all around and we had a great time. A month ago, I get a call from the Revere Library. It says, I would like, we would like you to come and give your presentation. Now, I'm pretty snarky and sarcastic up here about this stuff, but I go to Revere. Some of the people I'm talking to may be related to these guys. They may be in the mafia. So I call my friend. I said, Lenny, I'm going to Revere. He says, I'll have my cousins there. We'll be, we'll be fine. And my wife and my kids are like, oh my God, you know, dad's going to die and you know, we've got to buy a Kevlar vest or something. So there's going to be a different presentation in Revere that yes. you guys are seeing because it's going to be toned way down on some of the comments I make. If I figure out here in the suburbs, I'm OK, I hope. No, nobody's come after me yet. <laughs> and, interesting last paragraph. What's that? The bottom helping save the life of the corrections officer. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Didn't do any good. <laughs> All right, so there's another guy here named Bobby Garenti. So if you sort of think of layers, right, there's George and Lenny who went in. There's Donati who gave them the uniforms. But there could be somebody above that who sort of had some, some more planning uh, skills than anybody else. And this could be the guy. So Bobby Garenti hung out at, of course, TRC on Electric. He was a father figure to David Turner, who liked to kill plenty. Um, his widow 
said that he gave pieces, some of the 13 items, to a gother, another guy named Bobby Gentile, who we'll get to in a minute. And uh, another, another mobster said he told him that the stuff was buried in this guy's slab of his house, you know, like a Campanile slab, down in Orlando, Florida. Okay? Um, he died in 2004. There's, you know, there's not a lot of people to talk to about this anymore, unfortunately. So here's Bobby Gentile. So when I did that first presentation at Gardner, Mass, not only did the security director come forward, but the uh, head of the museum came to me and said, he got a call, an anonymous tip, that the paintings were in this guy's yard. Yeah. The guy had called the Gardner Mass Museum instead of the Isabella oh, Gardner no. Museum. Yeah. But the guy called up the FBI, the FBI scoots out there, grabs the tape. Next day, they're tearing this guy's house up. And in the basement of, in the bottom of the shed, they found a false floor. And there, were, there was a newspaper article about the gardener, and there was a list of the gardener items with maybe their worth, wow. but there were no items. Mm -hmm. But he was, he was friends with Garenti, and Garenti's wife said he got some of the paintings. And he, uh, he, he recently passed. That, that was in the news quite a bit. All right, so, oh, so there's this guy, William Youngworth. He stole Rembrandt's from Miles Connor. Uh, he held Connor's art. He was in jail the day of the theft, so he didn't do it. Um, he owned almost antiques, a store. I particularly like this, this here, right? Um, what's mm -hmm. his name? Liberace, like he's selling that Liberace. But he fenced stuff. Um, now he tried to scam uh, the Gardner Museum out of the reward money. And he called up a Boston Herald reporter and said, I'll show you one of the paintings. <laughs> so they went to a, um, a uh, warehouse, and he unfurled the painting part way and let the uh, Herald reporter scrape some of the paint off. And it was from the right time period, but it wasn't the right paint for that painting. So he was just trying to scam some money. Um, and he had a trailer. All these guys knew each other. Uh, he was a friend of Joseph Murray. He, Murray was the other guy with Whitey Bulger who did the Valhalla thing. Um, I know you guys can't see this, but let's show this up for a second. So while I was writing this and doing this thing, this is how I had to keep track of all of these guys. They're so interrelated. So this is like one mafia family. This is another. These are the guys going back and forth. My post -it. I mean, it's just so convoluted, and they're all intertwined and know each other, and uh, it's just a mess. But anyway, that was on my wall for the longest time. It's the only way I could keep track. There were just too many names. So then there's this guy. And again, this is gonna be a Revere, Revere thing. Jimmy Irish, Jim Marks. He bragged that he had two of the Gardner paintings, which seems to me a good way to get killed, which he did. So he was friends with Bobby Garenti, and they were up at Garenti's home in Maine. And Garenti said, you know what? Let's go down and see a movie in Revere. And you drive your car and I'll drive my car. So they drive down and Marx gets out of his car and goes up to his house, and he gets two shotgun blasts to the back of the head from Garenti, and this was his house. And you see this little light bulb? That was unscrewed. So there was no light for him to see, so he'd have to fiddle with his keys before he got shot. So this was not a haphazard thing. Somebody had called ahead and said, hey, unscrew the light. Um, and this is Garenti's wife who said that her husband did this. And that's just other stuff with other mafia guys and guns and all sorts of stuff. So where's the stuff, right? This is like the you know sixty-four thousand dollar question. So it could be in Revere, right? Bobby Donati had one of the things. Maybe he had all the things. Maybe they're in a wall, a closet. You know, maybe this old house will do a, re a rehab there, and a wall will come down. It's like, oh my God, the stuff's here. It could be in Revere. <laughs> it could be up in Maine, right? That's where the Garenti guy was. Maybe they just looked in the wrong spot. It could be in Connecticut. Maybe they looked in Gentile's shed, but they should have looked somewhere else. There was another mobster who knew these guys, so it could, there's talk it could be in Philadelphia. Or it could be down in Orlando. But they dug up his basement, the slab, and there was nothing there. So, you know, here's 
like I said, I'm kind of a simple guy. So my simple explanation is Donati paid the two guys to go in. They did. He gave them the stuff. Those two guys were bragging that they'd done it or they had some extra money. They get killed, right? Then uh, Donati gets killed in a gang war. So he's hidden the stuff and he hasn't told anybody. <coughs> and then the items are somewhere in Revere. And I have no better explanation than that's what I like. But it's so, it's so simple, right? Two guys to uh, Donati to Revere, gone. Now maybe they went with Garenti somewhere, but who knows? But I wrote a book, so I had to have an ending. So this is my so my, my main character in this book is a guy named Uncle Louie. So Uncle Louie is a real life guy who uh, was uh, the uncle of one of my wife's high school friends. And the real Uncle Louie is a lot scarier than this, right? His nose is like here, his knuckles were all busted. He just sat there like a big lump, never said anything, but scared the hell out of you. Just sit so that's Uncle Lou. So um, my wife grew up in uh, Swanskit, and we met at BC, and so I would drive up there all the time, you know, a thousand times. And when I had to come up with a place in Revere where I wanted the paintings to be, because understand, I've only sold like three or 400 books. So I write these for my entertainment and my friends. And as long as I find it amusing, it goes in the book. And if people don't like it, uh, yeah. so there are two million books published. 200 make it to bestseller lists. I'm never getting famous, so I don't care. Right? I just write, I write for my own entertainment. So my fictional ending is this place. It's on, I keep quoting the Linway, my wife corrects me, but it's on towards the General Edwards Bridge. So this says, Doc Kagan's Auto Clinic. And it just killed me because there used to be a sign with this guy with um, the silver thing, you know, that doctors wear, well, I forget what it's called. But it was like, if he was the doctor gonna fix your car. And I just thought that was hysterical on this little thing in Revere. This guy pretends he's a doctor fixing your car. So when I had to say where the paintings are, I said they're in the oil pan, you know, down in the oil uh, pit of where they changed this. And so that's where I say the paintings are. So um, if you really, if you want to know a lot more about this, there's a really good book by a guy named Steve Kirchin. He was a Pulitzer, he is a Pulitzer Prize winning author. He was part of the Spotlight team that uncovered the Catholic priest thing. Um, I've been lucky enough to talk to him a few times. Really nice guy. Um, he, he called me once and he said, uh, my dentist was at one of your presentations. <laughs> and I, I knew who he meant because she was like sitting right there and asked me a lot of questions. And he said, well, first, he said, first of all, she said you did a nice job. I said, thank you very much. He said, and thank you very much for pitching my book because maybe people will buy my book on top of your book. So but if you want to buy Steve's book, you know, send him a note, a note and say, I told you to. Uh, the other thing is there's a really, really good four-part series on Netflix called This is a Robbery by Mike Barnacle's Kids. Oh, fantastic okay. thing. Fantastic thing. Now, there are some things that I have here that they don't. That's no knock on them. But, you know, they just had editing and they did whatever. But that's a great thing to watch. So, uh, so this is my marketing part. Okay, so I have a book that's set on Nantucket. So my main character is Harry Bartlett. He's an accountant who turns into a fraud detective, and he finds his friend dead in a snapping turtle pond on Nantucket, and everything goes from there, and there's all sorts of cons and schemes on Nantucket. So that's that book. And then I have this one, uh, so I do my own uh, covers. I just get a picture and look. So this one took me forever to get the women to have their hair like perfectly matched. But so these are women, and I call them, Doppel Schwindlers instead of doppelgangers, <laughs> and they look exactly alike, and they run Ponzi schemes, and they lead my my character Harry Bartlett into a uh, a bad ending, and something happens. So that's that. Uh, the book I'm finishing now is called Ponzi. So my characters Harry's grandparents get scammed by Charles Ponzi in Boston, 1920. So I'm finishing that one by May. What if I keep my ass moving? Um, <laughs> But that was just fun with the historical stuff is interesting to do all the research about and like what things were around then and all sorts of like that. Uh, the book after that I'm going to do is called Played. So it's going to be four stories about four athletes, baseball, basketball, football, and hockey. And they're either going to run scams or be victim of scams. So I sort of like that one. I have to get a new cover. I don't like that cover. Uh, that'll be out next year. So I'm on Facebook. My books are for sale on Amazon. Uh, books are there. Um, this PowerPoint is on my website there. Um, 
buy a whole bunch of future things. If any of you really want to see this again, I doubt it. But um, if you feel like it, or I, I, I have other ones. Too. Um, oh, I'm, go I'm going to Vegas. I'm going to be with Cher. Uh, the paperbacks are 15. The hardcovers are 50. But wait. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I know, pretty good, huh? So to, if you buy two of the books, you get 20% off. My wife can do the math. And that's it. Thank Thanks. you.